I've been at BYU for the last three years, but I grew up in, in Utah Valley, in the beautiful city of Orem that you can see here from uh, the mountaintop nearby. And uh, the, the work that I'm gonna present today um, has been funded by the Utah DNR um, through their Watershed Restoration Initiative, as well as support from BYU National Science Foundation and a bunch of um, supporters. This is the, uh, um, the a picture of the organizers of the Utah Lake Symposium, which took place in August. And um, even if you don't uh, get anything from the talk, please check out utahlake.byu.edu. That's where all of the presentations from this symposium are archived. Um, there's also a comprehensive getting to know Utah Lake document that really gets into conservation and history and, um, and future. And so, uh, Ben, we can also put a link to that in the chat if you'd like. We'll get that going in the background. So. That'd be great. I appreciate it. And likewise, if um, anybody has questions, feel free to post them during the presentation. I'll also leave time um, so that we can talk at the end. Um, let's just start, though, by looking at Utah Lake. Now, some of us vegetation people have to set aside our biases, right? Because one of the major vegetation species here is, is invasive, Phragmites. But Utah Lake is is gorgeous. It's really stunning. In in the uh, Great Basin, it's the largest freshwater lake, and uh, it's a it's a, a gem, a vibrant gem of uh, uh, biodiversity and community in a, a very dry uh, landscape. So I want to talk today about these four themes: the history of Utah Lake, the status, the restoration, and uh, threats to Utah Lake. So let's jump right in with the history. If we went back twenty thousand years, um, this is what the Utah Lake system would have looked like. So at that time, um, the area was covered by a, a glacial lake, Lake Bonneville. And I like to look at the communities that currently are in Utah Valley. All of them would have been uh, underwater, um, several hundred feet of water, in fact. Now, uh, biggest geological flood uh, that we know about happened about 15,000 years ago. The um, uh, Lake Bonneville drained out through the Snake River Basin. And then because of climate change after that, uh, the lake level slowly dropped until it got to its current elevation about 4,500 feet above sea level. And this is really directly connected to stories of Salt Lake County and the Great Salt Lake because Utah Lake constitutes um, a large portion of the active part of the watershed, right? So you have the, the huge West Desert out here, doesn't have um, direct inflow to, to the Great Salt Lake, but. The Utah Lake system is one of the main tributaries that's connected through the Jordan River. And if we zoom in a little bit farther, you can see these tributaries coming into Utah Lake and then uh, the connection through the Jordan River. Now, uh, Utah Lake has a vibrant and diverse human history that extends back more than 20,000 years. Um, that's been told to us for a long time from the indigenous communities here, and it, and it recently has been confirmed by um, just this month with the paleo paleological discovery in White Sands in New Mexico. So pre-Clovis peoples lived in this area. Um, the Fremont and Numic peoples came. Uh, the most recent uh, indigenous caretakers of Utah Lake are the Timpanogos Nation. Now they're a part of the Snake Shoshone Timpanogostis Nation, and um, they inhabited much of central Utah, uh, and um, they were center, their, their culture was centered around Utah Lake. Uh, in fact, the word Utah, there are multiple theories of where it may come from, but one of them is that the Timpanogos word for reed, uh, the, uh, which is Utah, is where that came from. They, they, that was an important word for them that they used to describe this area because of the emergent vegetation in and around the lake. Now, when um, the Mormons arrived in, the 18, in 1850, the Timpanogos Nation was ruled by seven grandsons of Chief uh, Tiriunachi. And uh, initially, relations were very good. Uh, in fact, surprisingly good compared to many uh, regions. Unfortunately, within just a number of years, uh, those relations started to break down. Um, and by 1853, there was a conflict uh, that started known as Wakara's War between the Mormon settlers and uh, the Timpanogos Nation. Things calmed down, um, peace was restored, but uh, within a few years uh, after that, 
the, the larger Black Hawk War conflict, which was much bloodier and expansive, began. Now, I, I encourage you, if you want to get um, a, a detailed view of this, please search the Timpanogos Nation. They have a detailed history spoken from their, uh, written from their perspective. That's the most comprehensive and well-referenced of any that I've found. Um, now, finally, Chief Tabby, one of those seven grandsons, negotiated peace and agreed to relocate to the Uinta Valley Reservation um, in 1865. That was a reservation that had been previously created by uh, President Lincoln. Now, quite a, uh, more than a decade later, uh, four Ute bands from Colorado were relocated to the same um, reservation. So often that history is lost as well, that uh, the indigenous Ute community um, was relocated from uh, Colorado. So the Timpanogos are not Utes. Wukara and, and uh, Tabby were not, not Utes. Now, um, Utah Lake played a crucial role in uh, the, the early Mormon settlement of, of Utah. In fact, we focus on the seagulls a lot and the miracle of the seagulls we should be talking about the miracle of the June sucker because um, the, the abundance of Utah Lake, the literally tens of millions of fish that live there are what supported the new Mormon settlement. When there were um, crop failures in the early years in uh, Salt Lake County and Utah County, the, uh, the fish are what sustained the uh, Mormons through the winter time. This is just a picture from the 1850s of uh, how they were collecting um, native fish. Through the, in the early 20th century, Utah Lake was a huge tourist destination. There, uh, this is the USS Showboat on the left, uh, and another recreational craft. Really excellent history um, put together by the June Sucker Recovery Program. So check out Utah Lake Legacy. It's an awesome one-hour film um, on the topic. Now. Um, things quite rapidly in the 20th century got bad. And because of extreme diversions from the tributaries to Utah Lake, combined with a, a, a natural dry period during the Dust Bowl, Utah Lake completely dried out. There were only a few wet spots and um, the Provo River was rerouted, basically a canal through the dry um, lake bed. This is a picture from 1935. There were several lake drying events. This was devastating, of course, to the ecology of the lake. It was also devastating to Utah's economy. Um, property prices fell, a state of emergency was declared because the irrigation water moving to Salt Lake County was cut off. The governor drove across the lake bed in a, uh, in a, um, a pickup truck for a photo op to show that he was really doing something about it. But this was being caused by the uh, in enormous water pumps. The largest pumps, in fact, at the time were right here in, uh, in Utah County, taking water from the Utah Lake system. The uh, Utah Lake sculpin went extinct at that time, and most of the 13 uh, native fish were extirpated. The June sucker and um, Utah sucker are the two exceptions. Um, car carp had already been introduced at that time, the, uh, but the, uh, the extirpation of the fish as well as changes in the invertebrate community and plants completely changed the ecology of Utah Lake. Now, um, recent work by Janice Brainy and others using lake sediments to uh, reconstruct the history showed that there was a trophic shift in the 1970s where the um, food web in the lake went from primarily uh, emergent vegetation to uh, algae and cyanobacteria. That caused, um, again, uh, problems and issues. But starting with the Clean Water Act in 1972, and then crucially, the, the listing of the June sucker as an endangered species, restoration really began uh, of the Utah Lake system. We'll talk about that more in the, ne in the next uh, session, but let's, let's um, talk a little bit about the current status of Utah Lake. Um, if you just follow the headlines, this is what you think the current status of Utah Lake is. <laughs> and indeed, I talk to people in Utah County and all over the state, and I'm often asked, oh man, so sorry about Utah Lake. It must just be horrible. I'm pretty sure if anybody knows Rick Egan at the Salt Lake Tribune, this is the only photo, the, the only two photos they ever publish of Utah Lake. And that, I have a huge bone to pick about that because people get the impression that Utah Lake is mainly a cinder block covered in, in algae, filamentous algae. In fact, the current, the real status of Utah Lake is very different. Um, this is a picture of uh, one of the Nelsons, I think, up on uh, Mount Baldy overlooking the lake. Habitat and biodiversity are increasing. The, the June sucker was downlisted just this year. 
a momentous achievement, uh, a huge success uh, in restoration. Water flow to the lake has increased because of cooperative agreements, um, also because the lake has been granted senior water rights. So as bad as things are with the Great Salt Lake, they would be even worse if not for those uh, in-stream flows that are currently going to Utah Lake, largely um, to preserve June sucker and other habitat. Um, algae blooms, contrary to popular belief, are decreasing um, as a, for the lake as a whole. Now, there are some portions of the lake where that's not the case, and I'll talk about that. So I gave it a thumbs up and a thumbs down. It's kind of a mixed story. And then another positive is the public is becoming more aware of the lake. However, there still are um, pervasive misconceptions about what's going on in Utah Lake. So let's first talk about the algal blooms, the thing that makes Utah Lake the most famous. Uh, there now are two uh, definitive studies out, one by Tate uh, here at BYU, one by Hansen at University of Utah that used 35 years of satellite data to reconstruct when blooms were occurring, where they were occurring, how long they lasted. It shows a, a, a consistent decreasing trend in algal blooms for most of the lake. However, this uh, figure by um, Sinead Tate shows that areas that have wastewater inputs that are, are concentrated along um, the eastern shore of the lake actually have an increase in algal bloom intensity. And so that's really important. This is currently where most of the recreation around Utah Lake goes. So there, it's a legitimate perception that not everything is well, right? That we, we are still having algal blooms. Putting this into context, however, there was a study that just came out this year um, that showed that Utah, Utah Lake is down here in the middle that harmful algal bloom status is actually much better than the national average, and it's smack dab in the middle for Utah. So um, it, it does have issues with harmful algal blooms that we need to address by restoring water flow and reducing nutrient flows to Utah Lake. However, it isn't, uh, it isn't a disaster. Another common misconception is that the lake bed is contaminated and destroyed. In fact, most of the lake bed is, is fine, is, is in healthy and good condition. These are two independent studies that came to the same conclusion, showing that um, these, these are um, total phosphorus. However, if you look at other um, contaminants, it's a very similar story. Low levels of pollutants in the, in the lake, except for here in Provo Bay, where you have a concentration of wastewater and urban runoff that goes into the lake. And then um, up here as well, where you have an, another wastewater treatment plant. This uh, idea that we need to dredge the lake is not, not at all justified. Uh, Utah Lake provides extremely valuable ecosystem services um, that most people aren't aware of. Here, here's a list of seven of them. It regulates local climate. If you do the calculation for what the evaporation from Utah Lake does, as far as moderating the hot temperatures in the summertime, it's really astounding. Uh, very important um, source of precipitation. We get lake effects, not as impressive as your Salt Lake uh, lake effects with snow falls, but, but uh, still really important. It's, it provides water for communities all around and downstream of the lake. It's crucial habitat for hundreds of species, tens of millions of birds and fish. It, it removes nutrients and pollutants because of some of the really distinct chemistry of the lake, also because of the evaporation. It protects air quality. Uh, we had that fabulous presentation this morning about the risks of if we mistreat these uh, terminal lakes, um, how that can degrade air quality. Um, it, it is world-class recreation and views. Um, and then finally, and most important for me, it has extreme spiritual and cultural significance for indigenous peoples and immigrant peoples living in this area. I grew up um, water skiing and visiting the lake. My family, my four children, my wife and I visit the lake uh, as frequently as we can. It's, an, it's a truly extraordinary ecosystem. Um, there also are important industries that are springing up around the lake. The Utah Lake Photography Club, I encourage you to follow them on Facebook. Uh, there's an even larger Utah Lake Photography Club on Instagram with over a thousand um, followers. There are bridal shoots that go on around the lake, incredible nature photography. And uh, I just wanted to highlight a few of these. Check out the website. You can download them. Um, uh, the, all of the credits and citations are there. In every season, Utah Lake is gorgeous. Um, amazing opportunities to view and interact with the lake. It's the opposite of this view that's often pushed by um, developers saying that the lake is trashed. Um, really beautiful wildlife uh, and landscapes around Utah Lake. So now let's shift over to um, restoration. 
This is a painting by Rob Marshall. Um, and I believe that the title is Hobble Creek Revisited. We're not totally sure. Uh, shout out to Andy Pitcher Davis for connecting us with this um, beautiful painting. I love it because uh, Hobble, first of all, it shows the, uh, the vibrancy of Utah Lake ecosystem. But it all Hobble Creek is one of the tributaries to Utah Lake that was completely disconnected. It was put in a culvert, and uh, through restoration, it now is important habitat and an amazing recreation destination. Uh, Utah Lake is on the river to recovery. It really is turning a corner in in many ways. Um, here's just a list of few of them, that, but there are hundreds of ongoing and completed projects um, around Utah Lake. I'm going to highlight just a few of the largest ones. The June Sucker Recovery Program is often pointed to as a national example of how we should run um, uh, ecological conservation and restoration. Here is a, a slide put together by Chris Kelleher from the recovery. He's the uh, recovery programs director, highlighting the enormous amounts of invasive carp that have been removed from the lake. Depending on what mammal you divide by, we're talking about 123 blue whales or over 3,000 African elephants worth of carp that's been removed. And um, currently about three quarters of the biomass has been decreased and the removal efforts are aiming to keep it there. Uh, this is a slide put together by Melissa Stamp um, from Utah Reclamation Mitigation and Conservation Commission, highlighting the Hobble Creek restoration. Again, a national um, success story that's often pointed to as uh, um, a model for how we should run this. It created um, uh, access to the lake. It also restored habitat. And, and there now are June sucker and other native uh, species breeding there. Uh, another slide from Melissa Stamp, the ongoing Provo River Delta restoration is uh, increasing recreational access and habitat. Uh, the Utah Lake Commission is uh, doing a, an excellent job rehabilitating the reputation of the lake. They have an excellent website, utahlake.org, showing over 30 things you can do at the lake. Um, the DEQ has a website where you can check the algal bloom status. Again, when these blooms occur, they typically only close a portion of the lake and only for a, a number of days or weeks. And an ongoing trail system is being built around Utah Lake, uh, which has excellent uh, opportunities to increase active transportation and access for non-boating users uh, to the lake. There is an active citizen science community around Utah Lake. This is just one of the projects, a, a student-run um, Utah Lake Research Collaborative. There are two papers that just came out in a special issue in PLUS One if you want to get more details on that. And then just generally, there is research, outreach, and restoration going on across the lake, uh, including nonprofits, universities, state and federal agencies, and, and hundreds of local partners. It's a really exciting time for Utah Lake. But not all is well. There are major threats that we're uh, facing right now. Utah Lake is vulnerable because of its enormous watershed, 3,000 square miles. It's a semi-arid climate. There's high demand for water has some of the fastest growth anywhere. Salt Lake County is larger than Utah County, but potentially not for long. We're growing from 600,000 to 1.3 million in just a number of decades. And we have a population and policymakers who don't understand the lake. Um, so if I were to summarize the threats, the first one is apathy and misunderstanding of what's going on with Utah Lake. There are widespread misconceptions. There's a loss of cultural connection with the lake. We have um, development. We have smart growth proposals, but there are a lot of dumb growth proposals that are being considered right now. There are dangerous development proposals to build islands in the lake. There are uh, planned uh, water diversions. And then finally, we're facing climate change, which is disrupting precipitation, creating large mega droughts, um, supercharging algal blooms, and creating larger wildfires, uh, all of which can uh, affect the lake. So I want to um, finish highlighting a couple of these um, of these threats. First of all, in 2017, th this is the most existential and imminent threat to Utah Lake currently. A, a private corporation called Lake Restoration Solutions, which is like a noun salad that sounds really good, um, <laughs> but it's not really good. It, uh, they have been lobbying the state legislature to privatize and destroy Utah Lake. Um, over here on the right is the cover of their 252 page proposal of stock photos and false claims uh, that they released in 2018. You can find it on uh, FFSL's website. They now are circulating an updated pitch, um, a, a slide deck to legislators, municipal leaders, and even conservation groups. They're trying to uh, present this as a conservation effort um, to build credibility. 
Uh, here is uh, one of the slides from their new slide deck. They're billing this as the largest freshwater restoration project in the United States. They claim to have 6.5 billion, with a B, dollars of investment lined up. They also are making uh, untrue claims that permitting is all in place. They have this uh, undated quote from the Utah governor's office of economic opportunity. I called the governor's office and couldn't confirm if this was the current governor's office or the previous one. This is typical for this group, just kind of throwing everything at the wall. However, they have largely won over the state legislature. In April, they had a, a meeting with the state, a, a two hour lunch meeting with many members of the state legislature um, talking about how this project is going to be the best thing since sliced bread. Um, here is just an overview of what they're proposing. Look at the beautiful islands that they want to create within Utah Lake, um, shaped as delicate arch, a beehive, even a golden spike for good measure. Um, it's a for-profit venture to dredge the entire lake and build 30 square miles of artificial islands. They're promising to solve all of the lake's problems at no cost to taxpayers. It's a land transfer, the largest one in U.S. history, from the people of Utah to a private corporation. It's 10 times larger than the largest dredged island project ever undertaken by humanity. Um, 370 times larger than the biggest freshwater dredging project ever completed by humanity. Um, but they don't mention that. They just say, oh, it's going to be awesome. Lots of land, uh, lots of benefits. Uh, they have lots of beautiful stock photos. They're describing it as Lake Tahoe on steroids. Again, they claim to have large amounts of funding, and yet last year they went public on the SEC and only raised $200,000. But they got a law changed. HB 272 in 2018 allowed this to move forward, and they received last year a $10 million loan guarantee from the state legislature. This has been off of people's radar. Um, Many of us have thought it was completely unlikely that it ever would happen, and so uh, we didn't pay as much attention as we should, and yet it is completely live. I encourage all of you to get informed uh, and get involved. This would destroy the natural resilience of the lake. Um, I won't go through this now to save time, but uh, it's going to dramatically decrease the lake's ability to uh, maintain function with the increasing human pressure on it. Um, Chief uh, Executive Mary Murdoch Meyer, the leader of the Timpanogos Nation in August, gave an impassioned speech about this project. And I encourage you, go to utahlake.byu.edu to listen to her talk directly. But she said, Utah, I ask that you please take heed to what the experts opposing this project have to say. Our people and the reeds around this lake give you your name. We stand in favor of restoring the lake to its natural beauty, but have to oppose privatizing and desecrating this historic sacred site. Um, now, there are legal barriers to this project. In fact, um, this is not the first time that a major uh, alteration to Utah Lake has been proposed. In the 1970s, the federal government issued oil and gas leases for drilling underneath Utah Lake. Um, the, the local citizens and lawmakers were alarmed that this could cause pollution and permit permanent damage to the lake. And the Utah government filed a lawsuit that they eventually won in 1987. Uh, the Supreme Court upheld U Utah's responsibility and right to the lake bed um, of Utah Lake uh, under the equal footing doctrine. Now, since that time, other cases uh, in water bodies around uh, Utah Lake and in Salt Lake County have strengthened this public tr trust doctrine. However, with the HB 272 that was passed in, um, in 2018, it, it authorizes the, the state to dispose of sovereign lands in exchange for comprehensive restoration, which isn't clearly defined. So there is a real risk. This very likely would be um, challenged in court, but again, we shouldn't be asleep at the switch. There's another effort uh, called the Utah Lake Authority. This is new legislation patterned after the Inland Port Authority, which has been completely successful and non-controversial, I, I hear, in Salt Lake County. Um, it failed in 2020 because of opposition from the water community. However, it's currently under restoration. The, uh, a revised version of the bill has not yet been released. Um, so I, we don't yet know in the conservation research community whether this could be potentially a good thing for the Utah Lake system, a bad thing. Uh, but currently, the, uh, our ears are, are, um, are, are out. 
Also, there's there are perennial uh, proposals to create causeways uh, and, and modify the lake system in, in different ways. You know this better than I do with the Great Salt Lake. There always are unintended consequences. When you mess with the lake bed, uh, it affects the lake's ability to um, provide habitat and remove pollutants and affects the hydrology of the lake. And then finally, this is a, a three-dimensional rendering by Josh Lamont showing the degree of development in the Utah Lake watershed. Uh, you can see down here the cities that are rapidly urbanizing. Utah County funded this um, valley visioning exercise that shows that we could either, um, here on the left side is the baseline land use. If we don't have strategic smart growth, um, the sprawl will continue. This is gonna increase pollution, put pressure on the lake. However, we have the opportunity to have smart growth, to densify, to build and redevelop areas that are already disturbed so that we can preserve open space uh, and a, um, a healthy ecosystem. So if you wanna support these efforts, we currently are working with Conserve Utah Valley to get a beautiful uh, magazine printed and, um, and delivered to every member of the state legislature and local leaders. Uh, you can contribute directly to Conserve Utah Valley. Just earmark it as uh, Utah Lake restor um, Restoration, and, and, that, and that'll go here. So if, in summary, we need to foster community connection and understanding through education and recreation. We need to plan smart development with conservation-minded plans, restore, continue restoring river flow to the lake, decrease pollutants from wastewater and watershed sources, continue removing invasive species and restoring habitat, protect the lake from irresponsible and dangerous proposals. And then on top of it all, let's stop climate change. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much, Ben. Um, that, that was great. We actually, I feel like we were on a roll, so I didn't want to cut in with some of the questions. So I'll try to, uh, I'll try to keep it relevant and then we'll pull back a little bit to some of that happened earlier in there. Um, we had a few questions come through. I know there's, there's multiple windows in our chat. Um, so we try to keep all the Q&A coming in through Slido, which is what you see as Q&A. But I have posted a couple things in there. Um, I think there were some more questions about um, finding the uh, schedule for the Utah Lake, um, the Utah Lake Symposium. That is in the chat, and as well, I can put it in the Q&A. Um, but to get back to those questions, um, so I'll try and keep it relevant with these. I've got a little list here, and then we'll go back to the other or the ones earlier on. Um, do you know anything? This is more maybe about the specifics of how it could affect the ecosystem in the lake. Um, how would the proposed islands for development affect this current lake ecosystem? What are, yeah, so the, what, one of the fundamental changes that, it, that the island proposal would do is deepen portions of the lake. Currently, even when Utah Lake has algal blooms, it doesn't create dead zones or low oxygen zones. That's because the lake is very shallow and extremely well mixed. If you split the lake into multiple basins that are deep, then you have stratification. And as the algae grow and then the organic matter falls down, it, it, we could have large scale fish kills. There also could be release of nutrients and other uh, pollutants from the sediment that currently aren't happening because it's well oxygenated. The other aspect of the project that's really damaging is um, it reduces evaporation from Utah Lake. Now this is sold as like a benefit of the project. However, that evaporation is a source for precipitation. It also is causing the constant precipitation of calcite in the water column, which makes the phosphorus, one of the important nutrients in the lake, unavailable for algal growth. So this very likely would increase the duration and intensity of algal blooms. Those are just two ways that, it, um, that it's bad for the lake system. Yeah. And and I mean, also, just like as soon as you started saying this two questions are just flooding in. So I think this is actually a perfect opportunity. I know we have one minute, but I don't I don't want to tear away from this too much. Um, we will have about a 10 minute break between now and the next session. So that'll begin at 1145. But people who have had these questions come through, um, I think it would be great if we could move into this breakout session. That'll be it'll be the continued Q&A here with Ben. Um, and Ben, are you OK to meet people over there and continue the discussion about this? Fabulous. Absolutely. Okay. Hey, thank you so much, Ben.